This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. So we're now going to go through and look at IFRS 12, uh, which is an accounting standard. But the reason why we're looking at it within the groups part of the syllabus is because it's an accounting standard that relates directly to groups. Because what we've seen recently is there's been lots of standards that have been introduced that relate to disclosure. So IFRS 7 looks at financial instruments disclosure. Uh, IFRS 8 uh, looks at your operating segments disclosure. Uh, and we've got here is it IFRS 12 uh, that looks at disclosure that you make with regards to interest in other entities. So you have an interest in an other entity if you have an ownership of shares, isn't it? And the issue that you've got now is, is we see that we can have control, uh, we can have influence, we can have joint control, we can have no control whatsoever. Uh, and the user of the accounts need to understand why we've adopted that particular treatment with regards to uh, control, joint control, influence, and, and none of the above. Uh, and also as well, do the users of the accounts need to know a little bit more information than just what is included within the group SFP, the group statement of profit or loss and OCI and the group statement of cash flows? So are there, if you like, any other risks associated with the investment that you have that the user of the accounts may not be directly aware of by just reading the headline figures and the financial statements within the group accounts? So essentially, that's what IFRS 12 is all about. So if we think about the objective and the scope, uh, the objective is that it requires disclosure of information that enables the users of financial statements to evaluate firstly the nature of the risks associated with its interest in other entities. So you've got a subsidiary. Uh, you've consolidated that subsidiary. Great. The, the numbers are all hidden away, aren't they? Okay. Uh, you tend to see that the, the numbers are then broken down back into the individual parent subsidiary relationship when we look at IFRS 8. But what about joint ventures? What about associates? You know, they're equity accounted for. And we just see them in, in one line item. Investment in associate, investment in joint venture, share of profit of associate, share of profit of joint venture. That's it. So you don't see anything to do with the risks associated to it. So the disclosures will hopefully help that out. Uh, and therefore, what that then aims to do is help you give more detail about those entities in terms of their position, the performance and the cash flows. OK, it's more disclosure. So it is a little bit more, if you like, timely and consuming uh, in terms of the accounting process and the audit process. But hopefully it should provide additional useful information. If it wasn't to be useful, then, then we wouldn't think about including it. It helps your understandability, doesn't it? So what you have to do is you will apply it, IFRS 12, uh, if you have a subsidiary, if you have joint arrangements, if you have an associate, or if you have unconsolidated structured entities. Uh, so maybe there's an entity that you've set up within the business uh, that is not consolidated, uh, but you need to explain essentially why it is not consolidated, okay, to help you understand if you like the risk associated uh, with that entity that, that you have not consolidated. Okay, maybe you have control over it, but the, 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 there's some form of reason that, that you've not consolidated, but anything that is unconsolidated. So even your small, if you like, little investments of five, 10%. Okay. Uh, so IFRS 12, what does it say we do? We disclose information about significant judgments and assumptions it has made and any changes in determining that you control an entity. Okay. So why do you have a subsidiary and what has led you to treating it as a subsidiary? OK. Uh, why you have joint control or why you have significant influence over an other entity? OK. Uh, and when we look at the joint arrangement, information about the type of joint arrangements and what the standard goes on to say further as well as explaining why you've consolidated it and, and how you consolidated it and, and why it's an associate and why it's a joint venture and how you've accounted for it. It also requires additional disclosure on top of that about material joint ventures and material associates to help you judge the risks associated with them. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a company called the TUI Group. It's a travel and leisure business. 
that if you've been on holiday around Europe and booked a package holiday, you may have booked it with the TUI group. Or if you've been to the airport, you may see uh, a couple of planes around with, with, with that logo, uh, that smiley face uh, on the tail fin. Uh, and I'm just going to go through. You don't need to find the TUI group of financial statements. I've taken the extracts and put them on the slide presentation here. Uh, but it's just to give you examples. OK, so the first bit is one of the disclosure notes as part of IFRS 12 that tells you about why you've treated the subsidiary, the associate or if you like the joint venture as such. OK, and it talks about the principles and methods of consolidation. So. First of all, it talks about control. OK, uh, so what you've got there in that first paragraph, it says the consolidated financial statements include all significant subsidiary directly or indirectly controlled by TUI AG. TUI AG, uh, AG is the German equivalent of, of a listed PLC. Uh, so TUI is a German company uh, and that's essentially is the parent company. OK, uh, direct control, parent subsidiary. Uh, indirect control, parent, sub, sub subsidiary. OK, uh, so we'll see that a little bit later on when it comes to sub subsidiaries. Uh, then it goes on to say within the, in the next paragraph, uh, as a rule, control is exercised by means of a direct or indirect majority of voting rights. Remember, that's the key, isn't it? It's not just 50 percent of the equity share capital. Normally in F7, that did give us control. Technically, it's 50 percent of the voting rights. So we can pass an ordinary resolution. If we can pass an ordinary resolution, we can appoint the directors, can't we? And if that's the case, we put in place our directors, tell them what to do. So therefore, we have the power to direct. OK, uh, we then got further down. Uh, it goes through there and talks about influence. So obviously, they have to do with an associate. Uh, and again, associates for which the TUI group is able to exert significant influence over the financial and operating policies are accounted using, there we go, the equity method. And it says, as a rule, significant influence is assumed if directly or indirectly we have 20 to 50 percent. Obviously, there could be situations like we saw in that earlier example, whereby we own less than 20 percent. But maybe there are material transactions. Uh, maybe we've given some key management personnel over to that entity. Uh, maybe uh, as well, we have seats on the board that give us the power to participate. OK, uh, they're just saying 20 to 50 percent is definitely an associate. Uh, and then it goes through there. It says uh, significant influence. Uh, yeah, we spoke about that. Apologies. Joint control. OK, uh, joint control. Haven't yet seen it. But that's where by by yourself, you, you, you can't pass any resolutions, but two companies come together. So maybe you own 50 50 and two people come together and then you control that business. OK, uh, so there has to be a statutory legal requirement that decisions are made jointly. So even if you own 60 and 40, it could be joint control because you both have to mutually agree. OK, uh, so here joint control, which we'll see in the next chapter. Uh, it says stoics, stoics, stakes in joint ventures are also measured using the equity method, which we will see. Uh, you go through there and start to use equity accounting. Uh, a joint venture is a company managed jointly by the TUI group with one or several partners based on a contractual agreement. So there has to be a contractual agreement okay, uh, in which the parties jointly exercise control. OK. Excellent. And, and the, the key word there, I, I can't highlight it, but they need to be taken on a unanimous basis. OK, so everybody has to agree for something to happen. If people disagree, then things don't happen. OK, so you have to have unanimous consent. OK, uh, so that's telling you why we treated the, them as such, why we have control, why we have influence, why we have joint control and how we've done the accounting. OK, so it's nothing complex. It's just explanation. Then what I've done is just taken more extracts from the TUI group financial statements. And here they have gone through there and shown who the significant associates and who the significant joint ventures are. OK, uh, so you've got, is it three associates, three joint ventures? OK, and I start talking about the percentage ownership that, that we have there in each. Uh, so tying back into the, what we spoke about earlier on. OK.
Uh, and then what you've got is it just gives you more information. So it starts talking there about the combined financial information of material associates. So those material associates that you had there, is it Sunwing, Blue Diamond and Hapag Lloyd? They're given there and they're given, if you like, the key information in terms of the assets, the liabilities, the revenues, the profits and, and OCI. OK, because it goes through there and gives you more information. OK, uh, there we go. I'm not worried about what that information tells you. You know, that's up to the user, the accounts to interpret. I'm just expecting you to know what we should additionally disclose. Similarly, as well, uh, in terms of your material joint ventures. Uh, so what you've got here, again, your joint ventures, if we go back, are, is it Ryu Hotels, TUI Cruises and, and Tagabe Hold, Holdings? That's quite a, a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, what you've got there with your material joint ventures uh, is there's a little bit more disclosure that is required, particularly with regards to profit or loss. OK, so previously on the associate. We just had revenue and profit or loss and OCI here on the joint ventures. You have some more expenses uh, to help you judge a little bit more about the risks that are associated with that joint venture that you have joint control of. OK, again, similarly with regards to your joint ventures and the SFP, it's not just non currents and current assets and liabilities. It splits things out a little bit more to help you think about the value of the cash and the financial liabilities that you have, because financial liabilities are obligations to pay back cash in terms of payables with regards to, to loans and debentures. And there's obviously a considerable amount of risk attached to that, isn't it? If we are jointly liable for the payment of those loans. OK, so just a little bit of extra disclosure to help you think about the risks that are faced with. Then last but by no means least is a bit of narrative disclosure as opposed to just the numbers. Uh, and it says risks associated with the stakes and associates and joint ventures. So further disclosure. Geez, maybe this disclosure just gone too far, hasn't it? Uh, but here it says there are no contingent liabilities in respect of associates. Uh, whereby there were a lot last year, 235.9 million. So maybe that contingent liability was... Uh, wiped out, not necessarily, maybe we've paid it already. I don't know. OK, uh, and then it tells you about contingent liabilities for your joint ventures. And again, because those contingent liabilities are risky, aren't they? If they then convert themselves into a provision, you need to pay them. OK, and that will have a risk to the value of your joint ventures, the accounting that is then shown and potentially further risks down the line. Uh, likewise, as well, uh, it talks about leases that you've got. Uh, again, uh, quite considerable leases uh, in terms of the commitments. But again, that's just showing there in terms of the level of risk with the exposure of that investment that you have and the payments that that investment will have to pay in the future. Because if they have lots of commitments to pay, then you know, there's a likelihood there that your dividend will fall as profits fall and as the cash balance within the joint venture or the associate begin to fall. So in its most simplistic terms, IFRS 2 wants you to explain why you have treated an investment as such and how you have then accounted for it and then wants you to offer additional disclosures to do with the joint ventures and the associates with regards to the assets the liabilities uh, the revenues and the profits with additional disclosures required for your joint ventures okay that's it in a nutshell if it was to appear within an exam You'd be talking about three, four, five marks max. So nothing complex. You wouldn't have to prepare the disclosures. You would just need to explain why we have the disclosures and what the disclosures actually are. OK, other than that, it's a really nice, simple accounting standard for you to get your head around. Other than that, I'll see you all within the next session. Take care.